inviting me to come and speak your class. Um, tell me, tell me some things that are that you are uh, y'all are like. There's a reason I got invited. So would you set the context for me? Tell me a little bit about what you're learning that has to do with, I suppose, what I the topic I named was uh, learned helplessness. And I wondered what the context was. I think y'all have been talking about um, Appalachia mm -hmm. and um, an, 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 an idea or an attitude that would bring people who have left the region, what would bring them <coughs> back. So can y'all tell me something about, like, what do you know? What have you said so far? What are so you talking about? You, if, if, if there were so many economic disadvantages to being in a region, why would you, once having left or escaped the region, why would you, why would you come back? And uh, you got a pretty good stab at it. Social support is huge for people and a really good indicator for um, uh, overall health. In fact, did you know that a good marriage at age 50 by self-report is a better indicator for longevity, physical longevity, how long you'll live? and your overall health than your cholesterol number, which they're always telling you, right? Have that, get that cholesterol down. Um, relationships um, really do help us and uh, they provide a great deal of support. And I think if I wanted to uh, give you a, a, a way of looking at that, um, it might be to say that um, it, it's not just your experiences that are important, but it's also maybe as much or maybe <coughs> even more so your perception of your experiences or the events that are in your life. And in that context, when I was talking um, uh, with, with your instructor, she and I were discussing this thing called uh, uh, learned helplessness specifically, and I think you've read that article, right? And, um, and then m in a bigger way or more generally, something called locus of control or how much control you feel that you have in your life. And I think the article uh, that was really just a couple of pages out of the Simon 50 textbook gave you an uh, some like a look at how when you feel like you're in control, which you know is really faults. Nobody's ever really totally in control of their lives. But the perceived sense of control um, actually enhances health or, or goes hand in hand with not only good physical health but good psychological health. And we know that when people's minds are healthy, their bodies have a tendency also to be healthy. And when you are under a lot of stress mentally, you will see also that as stress increases psychologically, physical health usually declines. That's just, that's just the way it goes. And so we're tied together, you know, uh, what we call body and soul. You know, this is the area that psychology looks at anyway, is the body, the region of body and soul. So we know that, for instance, did you know that every single time we have some type of adverse weather event, like a hurricane, um, Im imagine the last significant hurricane we had where people lost, many people in this region lost their homes or um, even their livelihood. Um, you can expect an uptick in physical um, disease like cancer. But again, do you understand what I'm saying? It's your perception of an event that rules. And that's why two people can stand in the very same place, see two see the same situation and see it in two totally different ways, right? You ever, you, you know any, you know any half, half empty people? Like the glass is always half empty? And you know half full people? <coughs> and for them it's always half full? They watch the very same event and walk away with a totally different perception. And that perception is what rules in your body. And so uh, uh, as you read this article, <coughs> I think, um, you looked a little bit at personal control and uh, problem-focused coping versus emotion-focused coping. Is that is that right? And uh, and then you went you looked at learned helplessness. Can anybody give me an idea of uh, this context of learned helplessness? You you got a beat on what it means? I was actually going to ask for you to 
clarify? Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, first of all, do you remember the, the researcher's name that's associated with learned helplessness from the article? <coughs> Yeah, yeah, it's Martin Seligman. So he's a he's a pretty famous guy in this arena of psychology. And what he says um, is that uh, based on this piece of research, I mean, he's he's a pretty prolific writer. So this isn't his only area of research, but this is the one that he's really famous for. Um, they subjected dogs to a, 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 a cage that had electricity running through the floor of the cage, a small level of current, but evidently enough to be a little painful. And then we'd send that through the cage and uh, the dog would begin to look for a way to escape because we do, when things are painful, we do look for an escape out, right? And uh, finding none, the dog will eventually kind of curl up in a ball, go to the back of the cage and lay there and for lack of better verbiage, take it thinking that they have no way out. In other words, perceiving that they have no control over the event. If they experience this event over and over and over again and continue to perceive that they have no control, which again is a perceptual issue, then once an avenue opens for escape, the dog won't even attempt because it will uh, just sort of like take it. Like as though I, I can't, you can't really infer a mental attitude here because, it, first of all, it's a dog, and I'm not. I really dogs probably do do a lot of thinking, but I don't know, you know. But for sure, his behavior indicates that um, it, it does not believe escape is possible or likely, or you know, we we use the word in psychological terms, hope. He has no hope of of uh, avoiding that that problem. So that's basically we, when you learn to be helpless, and that comes at the hands of a repeated lack of control. Now, some people have um, perceived learned helplessness, perceived uh, uh, lack of control in one area but not in another. Maybe a student be begins to believe that they, um, that they can't do any better on in a class and so what you know they might just give up right you give up trying to say well I just can't do this I'm not going to be any good at this so I just give up I just stink at filling the blank algebra <laughs> you know you had that experience right <laughs> those of you who don't speak the math language and um, or but but you may be you may feel a, a great deal of control over in some other area like maybe your health or maybe you feel totally like you have no control of your health and you feel like you do have some level or modicum of control of maybe in, in the academic realm or whatever. Or maybe you see that, in, you, you see, so it can, it can vary by topic also. Um, um, a lot of that happens to be set in place and in motion as you are growing up, um, there are like a, there are a cluster of words here that kind of go together. One is learned helplessness, right? So I, t I talked to you about that. Uh, another cluster of words is: uh, Did y'all get as far as internal and external locus of control? So tell me what you know about tell me what you know about internal and external locus of control. Internal is that you can control. You can control external is like. It's not used by outside forces. Okay, so um, so what he's saying is that it, when you have an internal <coughs> locus of control, you have a tendency to look at events and say, I have an ability to uh, mediate or moderate this event or these circumstances. I have some control. Even though I don't have all control, I do have some control over something. And then an external locus of control feels that would you say this would be a good assessment if I said, what I do doesn't matter. Uh, I'm, the, it's all luck, <laughs> right? It's all out of my hands. I can't, I don't have any control over this situation at all, 
right? Um, which is a, what's your assessment of, uh, in fact, I think this text went on to say, yes, okay. So they looked at internal, people who had internal locus of control, and they found a subset of um, characteristics that also went with the fact that these people had an internal locus of control. So they, what they did was give them a questionnaire. They tried to assess whether or not they felt like maybe they were sort of in, you know, had some control over their situations or whether they were totally out of control and it was up to other people, other events, other, even just random luck. And then what they did was also look at other events that were going on in the person's life. So they, um, and all this is called correlational research. So you, the only thing you can do with this type of research is what? What can you do with correlational research, baby? Assume that it has, it's not affected by the causation. She gets an A because she's in the Psi 150 class and she just nailed it. <laughs> Nice. So uh, it, it, you have to, with all correlational research, you have to assume that you're only predicting and you're never seeing cause and effect. So you can't say, well, if somebody has an internal locus of control, that causes them to have an easier life or that causes these things to happen, right? You, you can only say you can predict one from the other, but you don't really know what's causing it. So these people with an internal locus of control, you also is, were able to see that they uh, enjoyed better health, acted more independently, um, achieved more in school and work, and felt less depressed than people who felt like other people in other circumstances were in control. So let's say if you grow up in a place like Appalachia, and um, you grow up feeling like uh, that you have no control, right? Um, <coughs> first of all, that's probably more determined by how your the people around you view the situation modeling than it is whether or not you have um, a lot of money in your bank account. Uh, one of the other pieces of research in psychology says that happiness is well, let's just feel like this money cannot buy you love. You know what I'm saying? It's just, it's not going to happen. Happiness, um, in fact, happiness has a tendency to increase as people put more of their uh, marbles in the I want a good relationship bag and has a tendency to decrease as people say I will be happy when I have more money. Because how much? How much is more, right? How, mu how much is more, right? Um, and yet there is some modicum level, of, there's some average amount of money that is so important. Um, just, you know, if, if you're living way below the poverty line and you look around and everybody else is not struggling to find something to eat or pay their rent or replace the tires or even have a car, then it becomes a little bit more difficult because we do have a tendency to look at the people around us. But by and large, if you are living in a situation where everybody has about, you know, you don't have a, a, a um, you know, your friends and the people that you're with, if y'all have about the same amount of resources as far as socioeconomic resources are concerned, money and things like that, it really, it, it, it's all very relative. And so you can see living in Appalachia if everybody's sort of broke, right? It's really it, you, you begin to kind of uh, adjust to your your scenario, the your setting, and it, it's not it's, it's not as bothersome as if you lived um, to <laughs> living hand to mouth and uh, everybody around you, you know, was um, doing it much different. It would that would set up a scenario where it would it would. Well, it could, do, it could do a lot of things. It would just be a totally different scenario. And so when people come back to Appalachia, if that's what they've known, and everybody is sort of at the same level, that really is not very surprising that there's not a great desire to leave if there's a high priority placed on relationships. And uh, a 
lot of times, I'm, um, especially in America, I think, we have a tendency to highly value material things over relationship values, you know, the values we get, we, we get um, from other relationships. But, what becomes very valuable is understanding that when it comes to uh, these psychological constructs like learned helplessness um, and how people make decisions, say, about whether to stay in a region or leave a region and go seek employment, a better life elsewhere, there are a lot of factors that come into play. Um, so it, Again, regardless of, of really environment or circumstance, what's more, I think what I wanted to say basically, it's more important not where you live and what kind of economic advantages or disadvantages there are available, but how you perceive where you live. <coughs> you know? Uh, I know some people um, in places in the world that have very, very little, but they, in their minds, they're rich. And some people who are rich beyond all measure socioeconomically, who are live in abject poverty as far as they're concerned. So it has more to do with how you perceive your environment, um, or at least as much. Obviously, you have to have enough resources to live. You know, does that make sense? I lived and worked in East Tennessee for a good number of years, and I um, did a lot of testing in uh, the county, when you first cross over into Tennessee, Cock County, Interstate 40, it's a uh, mountain, it's right at the edge of the mountains, and um, um, it, it was sort of a fascinating place to live and work. I did a consul consultation with the local, you have ever heard of Head Start? You know what Head Start is? And I was a behavioral uh, health consultant uh, with uh, Head Start. And so I got to spend a lot of time with four-year-olds every day. And uh, Clark County was an interesting place. To, it is, in Appalachia is an interesting place. Not really that much different even from Eastern North Carolina. Just different vocabulary, but, but a lot of the same mentalities. A lot of, it's rural, it's rural. And we are a little bit what they call in Raleigh throwback back here. You know, we, we, they always say we're 10 years behind whatever's going on in the triangle. <coughs> For a lot of things, I find that very comforting. You know? um, not in everything, but in a lot of things. That, that brings me comfort. So it's kind of it's a really interesting thing to, uh, to look at the difference in the cultures. Um, your class is out in four minutes. Mm -hmm. can, I take, can I take two more minutes and tell you a funny story about Cock County and me? I've taken your whole class, please. Okay. Um, <laughs> the vocabulary is different, though. The, the, the Appalachian vocabulary is different, and you. So I, as a rural, growing up here in Eastern North Carolina, knew I had a I had a rural mentality, and I could go there and fit in. But our vocabulary is different. So I was working in this. Um, I was working in a Head Start Center up on the side of a mountain. And um, it was a very impoverished area. And the teacher was so good to me. She was uh, had a classroom of about 20 students. And my job, pretty much, unless it was a problem, was to come in and just sit and observe students. And the teacher said, this child's having problems. I wondered if you might talk with her or her parents or whatever. Then I would set up those interventions. But a lot of the day was just sent uh, spent sitting on the floor watching the students to see if they were all developmentally appropriate and all that stuff. One child I watched, and she was sort of an enigma to me, she was always dressed to the nines. Her clothes were a very, I knew that, that someone had paid a lot of money for her clothes, and she was always dressed like hair and ribbons all the way down to brand, almost everything she wore was brand new. And it was odd she stood out from the other students because the area was so impoverished. And I wondered, I thought, well, maybe there's a grandmother or, you know, somebody who's, because they have to meet a, an income uh, uh, cutoff in order to be in the program. And one day I was in the floor uh, with them while they were playing, and she had one of those big uh, plastic cars, and she said, 
Barbie's going to the beach. And I'm Barbie's, she put Barbie in the car. Barbie's going to the beach. And Barbie, but Barbie's got to take some supplies to the beach. Because when we go to the beach, we always take dope. I say, you, you, you don't always take dope to the beach? She's like, yeah. I was like, no, 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 no. I didn't want to hear that because now I'm going to have to do something. No, no. And she didn't stop. She went on and on. When Daddy goes to the beach, he loads the trunk up with dope and carries it to the beach. Well, I happen to know that Cock County is on a highway, drug running highway down to Myrtle Beach, right? So, I, and so you know, my lightning fast mind went, two plus two equals ten, right? <laughs> Now I'm seeing why the kids all dressed up and, you know, okay, all right. right. I was like, don't say anything else. I don't want to know anything else. She was going on and on and on and on about all this dope that her dad had. Her, her dad loved dope, and he loved to give other people dope. And la, 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 la. And I was like, oh, no. So after the class was over and the kids had gone home, I called the teacher and I said, um, can, you, can you help me? This kid, she said that her daddy loads the trunk up with dope and carries it to the beach. And now I'm gonna have to. I, I'm like, I've got to do something. What? What am I gonna do? She's like, now I'm talking about this in this center on a regular basis. On a regular basis, somebody would break into that center and steal things like toilets. I'm not talking about like. They steal everything, but they didn't take the toilets out. It was it was an impoverished area. I said, "What am I supposed to do?" And the teacher said, "Did she say dope, or did she say dopes?" I said, "Well, now come to think of it, she did say dopes the whole time, but I just thought she's four. The teacher said, "Honey." In Cock County, dopes is Coca-Colas. <laughs> and I was like, yes! I'm so wrong and I love it. Right? Vocabulary is different. Right? You have to know. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thanks. I've enjoyed being here. You're welcome. It's another world. It's another world.